I'm glad to hear your wonderful response. Can you say amen again? Amen. amen. We praise God for the talents of Dave and Marlene Colburn. Dave is under treasure of the Southern Union here in the United States. Marlene has her doctorate in physical therapy and takes care of three active children. And they are going to be blessing us throughout annual council with their music. Uh, their CDs are some of Nancy's and my favorites. Good morning and happy Sabbath. What a privilege it is to be here together worshiping the Lord. I want to pay special note to some of our senior leaders who have been with us and are with us, those who are retirees, and uh, notably, Pastor Paulson, our past president, we welcome you. Bob Lemon, our past treasurer. We have former vice presidents who are here with us. And all retirees, we, we welcome you. And we ask that together we will work under God's guidance. You know, all of us have been called to be ambassadors for Christ. That beautiful section in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, we are ambassadors for Christ, but actually today we have an official ambassador with us. And I would like to introduce to you Ambassador Edward Jacobi Saweren Geta, who is the ambassador from Malawi to the United States. And he is a Seventh-day Adventist. Ambassador, would, would you please stand? And we want to welcome you in a very special way. Our focus today, as it has been during the annual council so far and throughout our annual council, will be a re-emphasis on mission to the cities. Those of you who were here yesterday and the day before felt the urgency of mission to the cities. Before we begin, I want to take about 30 seconds and ask you to pray silently where you are, because in the very recent history or past, we have had horrific things happen to some of our cities. Our hearts go out to those in Mexico City, to San Juan, to Houston, to Las Vegas, to Miami, to Tampa, and many others. They represent people who have received horrific results of the reason why we proclaim that Jesus is coming soon, because these results are not from God, but from the devil. I want you to pray for the people who are still suffering and many others in cities that are never mentioned by the international news but have terrible situations happening to them. Let's take 30 seconds, pray silently for the people of these cities and others. Lord, be with the people in the cities and the countryside. Help us now to understand your will for the Seventh-day Adventist Church in reaching P. 
people everywhere. In Christ's name, amen. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages. This is Matthew chapter 9. Teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now listen to the servant of the Lord. The message that I am bidden to bear to our people at this time is work the cities without delay. The time is short, for the time is short. The Lord has kept this work before us for the last 20 years or more. A little has been done in a few places, but much more might be done. When I think of the many cities yet unwarned, I cannot rest. It is distressing to think that they have been neglected so long. A few have borne the burden of working in these cities, but in comparison with the great needs and the many opportunities, but little has been done. Where is your faith, my brethren? Where are the workmen? Now, from the book of Jonah. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. You see, Nineveh, the Assyrian capital, was one of the greatest cities of the ancient world. It had been founded on the edge of the Tigris River soon after the Lord's intervention at the Tower of Babel. Over time, it had grown so large, it took three days to traverse that city. It had become an exceedingly wicked and crime-ridden city. However, as Prophets and Kings, page 265, indicates, God had perceived in that city many who were reaching out after something better and higher, and who, if granted opportunity to learn of the living God, would put away their evil deeds and worship him. And so in his wisdom, God revealed himself to them in an unmistakable manner to lead them, if possible, to repentance. The instrument chosen for this work was the prophet Jonah. God is still calling his servants today to reach the cities where there are many who are reaching out after something better and are willing to listen to Bible truth shared through various methods. Christ wants us to go into all the cities and villages as he did, teaching, preaching, and healing in his name. This is still his plan and his longing desire. At the 2011 Annual Council, we launched the emphasis on mission to the cities. God has been longing for a concerted effort to reach the massive urban centers of the world with his last day message. The world around us today is crumbling and changing politically, economically, socially, culturally, ecumenically, and in the natural world. My fellow leaders assembled here at this 2017 annual council, we are now six years beyond 2011 and in a new quinquennium with even greater urban challenges. The world is in even worse condition than it was six years ago. I believe even more today than ever before, that Jesus is coming soon. What a time to reach out to the millions in the cities where the world's majority population now lives. Much had been done by the church to reach the cities prior to 2011. Praise God for that. 
Much has been done since 2011. And yet, we have only made a small beginning in comparison to the swelling populations of the great cities of the world. God's call to the Jonas of today, you and me, is as direct as it was when Jonah received the call. Christ's laborers are still few in the large cities of the world. God is pleading with us to reach these massive secular fortresses with the life-giving message of the gospel and the three angels' messages focusing on Christ and his righteousness. We are to use Christ's method of reaching the people, as found in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And we will review that in just a few moments. However, back to Jonah. We will not focus on the most well-known and recounted portion of Jonah's story, found in Jonah 1 and 2, his attempted escape from God's command, the subsequent fury of the heaven-sent storm, his submission to God's authority, his recommendation to the sailors to throw him into the raging sea, his miraculous and supernatural salvation by a great fish, his soul-searching experience of three days in the belly of the whale, and his being thrown up by the great fish onto the Mediterranean beach after learning his lesson. No, let's now pick up the really crucial part of the story relative to mission to the cities. Jonah's second chance and what happened to a great city when God's truth was proclaimed. As was read already in Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, we recount. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. You see, Jonah had partially learned his lesson. He didn't want to spend another three days in the innovation lab learning center of a great fish's stomach. The story reveals that his conversion may have been somewhat self-serving rather than truly selfless evangelism. I want to thank all of you and many others who have taken seriously the mission to the city's call from the Lord. However, are there some of us and I have to include myself, who have sailed for Tarshish rather than fully engage with the task of reaching the cities? Have we given lip service and only superficial attention to the great task of reaching millions in the metropolitan centers of the world? preferring to lavish attention and money on Seventh-day Adventists who already know the truth? Have we truly challenged our members to reach out to others in total member involvement? Do we really believe what we read in the spirit of prophecy? And let me tell you, I make no apology for the spirit of prophecy. The messages from heaven through Ellen White are as profound and applicable today as when they were written. Yes, of course, we believe in the Bible as God's word and our only rule of faith. We do not in any way substitute the spirit of prophecy for the Bible. However, the spirit of prophecy was given to lead us to Christ and to the Bible. And we've received powerful, practical instructions from God through the spirit of prophecy. And we are to be increasingly attentive to those instructions as we see the day of the Lord appearing. So let's reread Medical Ministry, page 304. I referenced it yesterday in the appeal made after our special emphasis. There is no change in the messages that God has sent in the past. Get that sentence, no change. 
The work in the cities is the essential work for this time. When the cities are worked as God would have them, the result will be the setting in operation of a mighty movement such as we have not yet witnessed. Are we ready for the mighty movement? Are we praying daily for the outpouring of the latter reign of the Holy Spirit? Or are we focusing on our own independent ideas, pulling us away from God's church and the true mission entrusted to us by heaven? Are we personally and therefore corporately ready for the extraordinary Holy Spirit power from heaven that will usher in the very last proclamation of prophetic biblical truth just before Christ's second coming? Or are we focusing on our personal views and concerns rather than our heaven-born mission? Do we believe that the work in the cities is the essential work for this time, even if we're not running away like Jonah at his first calling? Are we half-heartedly entering the proclamation to the Ninevehs of today in our second calling with only a self-serving approach, using human ideas instead of heavenly-inspired ideas? Do we have faith in what God can do through a humble and willing people? Now, what are these heaven-inspired ideas for reaching the great cities of the world? According to the spirit of prophecy, they are bound up in the practical application of portraying Christ's character in personal outreach to others and the preaching of God's holy word under the power of the Holy Spirit. This involves the use of centers of influence, local members, local churches, teams of young people involved in a variety of outreach initi initiatives, such as the One Year in, in Mission and the Thousand Missionary Movement, literature evangelism, small group evangelistic outreach, medical missionary work, comprehensive health ministry, health lectures, vegetarian restaurants, health clinics, door-to-door -door missionary work, health expositions, community services, and social work that, follow Christ's, that follows Christ's methods involving Adventist community services and ADRA, integrated media evangelism and social media, counseling centers, reading rooms, and Adventist book centers, Bible studies provided by every age group, evangelism by children, evangelism by young adults, evangelism by women, evangelism by men, personal evangelism and witnessing with family and friends, evangelism by educational institutions, public evangelism adapted to every context, outpost centers outside the cities providing homes for urban workers, training centers for urban missionaries and lifestyle health centers, and many, many more Holy Spirit-inspired methods. These are the profound concepts from heaven, portraying an in, in the city, and an out of the city method of working the large metropolitan centers of the world. Mark Finley, a very close colleague and an assistant to the, to the uh, General Conference President's office, and his wife, our good friend Tini, they've developed a wonderful outpost training center, if I can call it that, in Virginia. It's called Living Hope. Tini, I've visited there. It's an exciting place. It's growing. Tell us what's happening in this Living Hope Center. Well, we are very excited about our Living Hope Evangelistic Center. Thousands of people are flocking to the suburbs. Northern Virginia is one of the fastest growing areas in the entire state. And thousands of people within, that live within close proximity of the nation's capital are just flocking to these suburbs in small country towns, which 25 years ago were just a few thousand, are now becoming growing cities. So when my husband and I moved to Dominion Valley in Haymarket, Virginia, eight years ago, 
We believed that God had led us for a special reason, but we really didn't know why. But I had the growing conviction that God desired for us to establish a church, a training center, and a Living Hope Community Center. And through a series of miraculous providences, God opened the door for us to have a church now that seats 250 people, a media center, a school of evangelism, and a community health center. And pastors and lay people, not only throughout North America, but now even around the world, are coming for our short-term five to seven day intensive sessions on church growth and evangelism. And many of our pastors and lay members are leaving excited to reach their communities for Christ. This past year, we conducted 19 separate health programs in our Living Hope Community Outreach Center. Our programs included natural lifestyle cooking, living to a healthy hundred, stress management, Bethlehem and beyond, and even a health expo. We also conducted several biblical, 16 biblical programs, which included Unsealing Daniel's Mysteries, Great Doctrines of the Bible, and Biblical Archaeology. The exciting thing is over 500 people attended our outreach community sessions with well over 250 non-Seventh-day Adventist guests that registered. And since many of our guests attended multiple programs, we actually had over 150 non-Adventist guests that came to almost all of them. And the response has been outstanding in our upscale gated community. We've developed friendships, made an impact in the community, and people are now attending our small group and taking Bible studies, and they're coming once a week to our Great Doctrines of the Bible series. This past week, we just launched a new series in a hotel banquet room in Manassas, Virginia, not far from our center, and over 100 non-Seventh-day Adventist guests attended. We're experiencing the truth of the prophet's words. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence, and then he bade them follow me. It is our desire to follow Christ's method and to give the rest of our lives in training others to his selfish, in his selfish minist selfless ministry to reach the lost people for his kingdom. And we know, my friends, that there are many, many on the verge of the kingdom waiting only to be gathered in. Amen. Thank you, Thank you so much, Tini. Many of you know Gary Krause. He is the director of Adventist Mission and an associate secretary of the General Conference. Gary has a great burden for centers of influence, as Ellen White calls them, in urban areas. Gary, tell us what God is doing in these centers of influence. Okay, thank you, Elder Wilson. There are hundreds of centers of influence around the world today, and there are many different types of centers. We have vegetarian restaurants, we have lifestyle centers, we have reading rooms, we have cultural centers, we have refugee assimilation centers, we have secondhand stores, the list goes on and on. But the one thing that they have in common is that they are getting us outside of the four walls of the church and they are embedding us in the community where we belong, as Tini said, to mingle, show sympathy, minister to needs, win confidence, and lead people to Jesus Christ. Just recently, I was in the country of Chile, and I had the privilege of visiting just some of the 15 centers of influence in that country. Had the privilege of meeting this young woman, Michelle, and tears came to my eyes as I saw her telling the story of this older woman from the community who she had personally led to Jesus through a center of influence, a one year in mission volunteer. Likewise, through a center of influence there in Chile, this philosopher 
at a prestigious Chilean university came to Jesus Christ and the Seventh-day Adventist Church, again through the witness of a one-year in mission volunteer. In Argentina, I heard the story of this woman who was ministered to through a center of influence. She said, I wasn't looking for anything, but I found everything. That is the purpose of a center of influence, and that is how God is using them, Elder Wilson, around the world today. Uh, now, let's hear about two more centers of influence that are just developing and represent many, many around the world. Uh, Sam Saw, president of Southern Asia Pacific Division, Pastor Somchai, president of the Southeast Asia Union, and Peter Kulik, volunteer director of the General Conference Development and Construction Consulting Service, are going to tell us about what's happening in Hanoi, Vietnam. Hanoi is the capital of Vietnam with a population of 8 million. It is predicted that by 2025, the city will be the fastest growing city in the world in terms of GDP. Yet we only have 40 Seventh-day Adventist members, and until a year ago, there was no church there. We need to find ways to share the gospel. In 2014, we decided to establish a strong presence in Hanoi to meet the needs of the local people. Most property is sold by word of mouth, and over a period of three years, we inspected over 40 properties without success. But the Lord's timing is always perfect. Last October, we arrived in Hanoi to look at three more properties. We were discouraged because all of them were expensive and not suitable. But then, out of nowhere, just out of nowhere, a property fell right into our lap. An Adventist businessman from Ho Chi Minh City he contacted us, saying that his son had a friend who had parents, whose parents were a new contractor in Hanoi, who was working for a property developer who had a seven-story building under construction. The following day, we met with this developer and his family. We inspected the property and immediately understood that the Lord was saying to us, here it is, it's yours, use it for my glory. When we came to Hanoi, this property was not even on our radar, yet we decided to purchase it immediately upon inspection. Elder, this all happened so quickly, and that it was so clear that, that the Lord performed a miracle and led us to this building. Construction is uh, complete, and soon this community this is a uh, community uh, center. We'll be serving Hanoi, which is the capital city of Vietnam and northern part of the Vietnam. And also, uh, this building will include uh, the music, book, and the half food product store, as well as, as a English language, and then the music uh, classroom, as well as uh, the health and then the wellness centers over there, as well as the auditorium for the con local congregation worship, as well as the international uh, congregation gathering, worshiping there. We set aside one floor for the Adra Vietnam to have their office over there. And as soon this center will be serving the community in the Vietnam. And then also we praise the Lord for uh, this building that he has given us. We praise him for his guidance and for his provision. And then uh, as we continue to labor together with the GC, the unions and the divisions and uh, peace and happiness and then uh, his people, we can continue serving the Lord and sharing the message that he wants us to share to these people in Hanoi. Thank you. Please pray for the seven plus million people in Hanoi and our handful of Seventh-day Adventists. Now let's look at another center of influence in the making. It's been there for quite a while, but it's receiving a fresh approach. Ramsey Square in Cairo. Rick McEdwards, president of the Middle East and North Africa Union, and Peter Kulik are gonna tell us about Cairo, a city of, depending on how you calculate, 17 plus million people. As you mentioned, uh, Elder Wilson, uh, Cairo, Egypt is the largest city of our union and the second largest city of the continent of Africa, uh, second only to Lagos, Nigeria. 
And in the center of that city is what we call Ramsey's Square. Right next to Ramsey's Square is a large building. And uh, right there is the, right there at Ramsey Square is really what we call the heartbeat of the city. Uh, there is a massive uh, railway station underground, a, a subway. All the people stream right out of there and eventually come right up to the surface of the road where they see our building in front of them. Uh, in the 1960s, Elder Neil Wilson helped to pave the way for the construction of this building along with many others. It has more than 700 seats in uh, the center of Cairo where evangelistic meetings had been held for many years and unfortunately due to the ex-migration of many uh, Egyptians over the years of a Christian background, there has been a steep decline in this church of attendance, and the last time I visited there, there was a group from South Sudan of about uh, 50 people and a handful of 15 um, Egyptian Adventists meeting in this massive auditorium, much larger than the one we're sitting in today. So we have been w dreaming and praying, how will God use this building as we move forward? When I met with the MENA leadership in Cairo last November, and again when I visited earlier this year, it became clear that we needed to rethink the purpose and use of this, this important site to meet the needs of the local community. The Ramsey Centre is structurally sound, but it does need major renovations in order to be the relevant presence we know it can become as both an urban centre of influence and a place to hold two congregations. At this stage, Renovations have just begun. The plan is to demolish the interior, which will then be designed to allow for multiple outreach initiatives that can serve the local people and bring them to know Christ in practical ways. To be honest with you, we can't wait to serve the local people in the neighborhood. It is the hub of the city, and in this location we will house a kindergarten, a language school, a health promotion center, uh, two congregations, and many other classrooms and services that will be able to serve the people all around in order to help them know the love of God and to prepare them for the coming of Jesus. Amen. Pray for the people of Cairo. You know, we could have asked any number of you to give reports of how God is leading in your area, in departments that are sharing the word of God in the cities. But we're giving you just a little taste of what is going on. Now, a marvelous evangelistic emphasis is taking place in Jakarta in Indonesia, involving special lay teams. My wonderful colleague, G.T. Ng, our GC secretary, has taken Indonesia as a special personal evangelistic focus. GT, tell us what's been happening in Jakarta. Thank you very much, Elder Wilson. Uh, what I see in Jakarta is absolutely astounding, considering the Muslim context uh, of the country and of the city. Uh, I think they have the best urban mission model on planet Earth, and I'm not kidding. Because uh, this group of people called the CMC group, uh, they use the inspiration model of using the health message as their entering wedge. And uh, they exemplify seven principles of uh, urban mission. Number one, they believe evangelism is a way of life. Number two, they believe that evangelism is a marathon and not a sprint. Number three, they believe evangelism is a process and not an event. That's the reason why evangelism goes on uh, throughout the year. Every Sabbath is an evangelistic meeting. Number four, uh, these people understand that uh, evangelism uh, is successful only when we follow Christ's method. Number five, the ministry uh, was initiated by lay people and it is maintained by young people and the momentum is also maintained by young people. Number six, apostasy rate is extremely low because they use Alan White's inspiration model of small group ministry. The last one, uh, the, the ministry, so far they have planted five churches. 
and everyone is still going strong. And one of the reasons is that uh, for the first three years, they will drink the mother's milk. After three years, financial assistance will be cut off, they become self-reliant. So these are the seven principles they have exemplified, and we just praise God for them. Thank you so, thank you so much, GT. Now we could go on and on with practical illustrations as to what God is doing in the large cities of the world and interview many others. However, this massive work is not and will not be accomplished only by paid pastors. In fact, we need total member involvement, everyone doing something for Jesus. We've seen total member involvement take off around the world, not because it's a new, innovative idea, but because it is what God has called for in the spirit of prophecy for decades. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9. You know this one. We've used it many times. The leaders in God's cause as wise generals, this is page 116 to 117, are to lay plans for advance moves all along the line. Now, all of you are administrators. You are the, quotes generals. In their planning, they are to give special study to the work that can be done by the laity for their friends and neighbors. The work of God in this earth can never be finished until the men and women comprising our church membership rally to the work and unite their efforts with those of ministers and church officers. It is interesting, total member involvement, TMI, that it has energized lay people in a marvelous way as it builds on revival and reformation, our relationship with Christ. In many divisions, it has become a very motivating vision that has transformed churches into powerful, soul-winning agencies. I'm personally asking that all local fields, unions, and divisions emphasize this amazing TMI method from the spirit of prophecy, and of course, scripturally based, that God envisioned based on a constant revival and reformation approach and active involvement by church members. Let's revitalize our church members in every area of church mission life, including our Sabbath schools, as we emphasized this morning, with Bible study, fellowship, outreach, both locally and globally. Let us tie in our Seventh-day Adventist biblical lifestyle and values in the area of health reform, complete abstinence from alcohol, coffee, tea, tobacco, and improper drugs. Let us live fully the health message with a careful diet and plenty of exercise. Let's personally engage and promote Christian stewardship, sharing God's supernatural lessons in our own personal lives. Let's champion well-ordered biblical families, a man and a woman in a loving marriage with a mutually respectful relationship. Christian families grounded in biblical love originating from God. Men, women, children, all carrying a responsibility for sharing Christ with others. All of this is possible as we lean on Christ for our every need, as we realize that total member involvement involves everything we are and have, that giving of ourselves and talents for the good of others produces rich rewards on this earth and in heaven. Total member involvement. Dwayne McKee is our worldwide TMI coordinator. His wife, Kathy, works in our presidential area as a coordinator of evangelistic and electronic outreach. Duane and Kathy, tell us how God is using TMI to connect the dots, as you always like to say, Duane, of outreach activities and getting everyone involved in doing something for Christ in the large cities and the rural areas of the world. Tell us also about one focal point next year, the world's largest city. Tokyo, and other large cities of Japan. 
Thank you, Otter Wilson. <clears throat> as you well remember, just uh, last year we had an exciting time as as we went to Rwanda when we had experienced the largest baptism in the history of the Adventist Church with over a hundred thousand baptized. How did this happen? It happened because thousands of lay people were involved in all kinds of outreach, from medical to ADRA. Many thought, well, that's Africa. Well, what about Europe? What can we do there? This is an Orthodox stronghold from what people are telling me. Pastors had said to us before, it won't work here. It worked back in the 90s, right after the fall of communism, but it won't work here. Won't work here. People will not come. Will not come. Would this really work in a place like Romania? This is really putting TMI to the test. People say, oh, evangelism doesn't work. It's not going to work here. Well, it's working here. We're having a revival in Romania. No one ever thought this would happen here. Visitors coming every night, more and more people, and it builds throughout the week. It shows us that there are seekers of truth even here in Eastern Europe. It's so exciting the way people are gathering together in over 4,000 sites in six countries presenting the precious Advent message. Visitors are hearing about the meetings through many different ways. People see it on TV, they hear it on the radio when they're driving in their cars, when they're on the buses, when they're on the taxis. People have just supported in a marvelous way and visitors have come in droves. We are seeing such a revival with these meetings. It's unbelievable. A revival of not only the church members, but the pastors and the elders. They want to become more involved in evangelism. So many of our lay people are involved in presenting in homes, in storefronts, in churches, in wherever, because God is in TMI. Now let's go to Nepal, where Adventist World Radio is broadcasting. Global Mission Pioneers and Total Member Involvement Bible Workers are working, and baptisms are taking place in very secret and private places. Dwayne, this is so exciting. We just are praising God for this miracle. Actually, it's working in East Africa. Uh, just last night, we heard that 250,000 people have been baptized in East Africa. It's thrilling. We gave them 1,000 video projectors. ASI has given them some the, the broadcast, the New Beginnings uh, sermons with flash drives on them. 70,000 were baptized in Arusha alone. Then let's go to Mindoro, Philippines, where pastors said AWR and TMI radio won't work here. But it worked with nine radio stations and 36 lay people who were inexperienced broadcasters. First, one village called in and said that they wanted to become Seventh-day Adventists to send them a, a Bible worker, then another village, then a third village. And actually, Kathy, after... After the two weeks, there were 15 villages. Wow, I said to Duane, every day is like Pentecost. Just before the end of the meetings, we received a phone call, and it was from a chieftain's wife. And she said, "We, I, I am representing a whole island of 10 villages. Please send us someone to teach us so that we can become Seventh-day Adventists. Japanese pastors were invited to Mindoro to preach in English, and we were told it won't work. It won't work here. You can't do that. But it did work when 48 Japanese pastors and lay people preached their first evangelistic series, resulting in over 1,400 baptisms. Our Japanese brothers and sisters did a wonderful job. We were so proud of them. They said they would never be the same as they prepared for All Japan 2018 Maranatha. TMI did work, and TMI is working back in Japan, as one church has already doubled its attendance. A Japanese laywoman is preaching right now her first evangelistic series in Japan. As we speak, AWR is getting ready to broadcast to Tokyo, the largest city in the world of 38 million people. 
AWR will broadcast health messages, Peter, designed to push listeners to health seminars and local churches by God's grace. It will work in 2018 in Japan with 150 evangelistic meetings. And TMI will work with the same approach in India for 2019 with 2,000 AWR TMI video projectors and 10,000 AWR God pods. By his grace, TMI will work with the health message approach, the same approach with AWR God pods in China. Folks, the sky is no longer the limit. Now, now we have WeChat radio, we have WhatsApp evangelism, Facebook radio. What a time to be alive. Amen. What a... <laughs> Please pray in a special way for the outreach in Japan. Uh, our leaders there uh, are gathering spiritual strength to reach out to the 124, 125 million people in Japan. I'll be there preaching next year, but primarily local pastors and lay people will be conducting evangelistic meetings. We need everyone involved, total member involvement. Let's start in our own existing churches. In some parts of the world, there are settled pastors. Now, that's a quote from the Spirit of Prophecy, essentially, which is a pattern that was taken from mainline Protestant churches as opposed to the original approach our pioneer leaders and pastors had for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Some of us have just returned from an Adventist heritage tour, general conference and division officers, where we saw how God worked through our pioneers in phenomenal ways because urgency and mission was at the top of their agenda. In the early pioneer days, church members were trained and guided by evangelistic and itinerating pastor slash evangelists. After being trained, church members then told the pastor, you go evangelize new areas and we will take care of the church and support your outreach. Now, let's look at some fascinating counsel from the spirit of prophecy. We're going to read quickly, look at what it is. Instead of keeping the ministers at work for the churches that already know the truth, let the members of the churches say to these laborers, go work for souls that are perishing in darkness. We ourselves will carry forward the services of the church. We will keep up the meetings and by abiding in Christ will maintain spiritual life. We will work for souls that are about us, and we will send our prayers and our gifts to sustain the laborers in more needy and destitute fields. Another quotation. If the proper instruction were given, if the proper methods were followed, every church member would do his work as a member of the body. He would do Christian missionary work, but the churches are dying, and they want a minister to preach to them. They should be taught that unless they can stand alone without a minister, they need to be converted anew and baptized anew. They need to be born again. Another quote, it weakens those who know the truth for our ministers to expend on them the time and talent that should be given to the unconverted. So long as church members make no effort to give to others the help given them, great spiritual feebleness must result. Another one, the greatest help that can be given our people is to teach them to work for God and to depend on Him, not on the ministers. There are times when it is fitting for our ministers to give on the Sabbath in our churches short discourses. I suppose I better get a lesson from that too. <laughs> Full of the life and love of Christ, but the church members are not to expect a sermon every Sabbath. I want to encourage church leaders on every level around the world to help churches and pastors focus on the mission outreach of the church with mission to the cities being a huge component of our strategic evangelistic plan called Reach the World. Let's personally encourage all others to aim our attention at the mission of sharing the three angels' messages 
focusing on Christ and his righteousness instead of focusing on private goals, independent thinking, skeptical pronouncements, cynical criticism, aberrant theology, depreciation of our fundamental beliefs, antagonism towards our prophetic message, misguided social action as opposed to complete gospel practical Christianity, false feel-good existential religious experiences, substitutions of emotionalism for solid Bible truth, cold religious formalism, disastrous false belief in evolution, and so many other distractions that the devil would have us pursue. Realize that our own personal relationship with Jesus, and I speak to myself through Bible study, study of the spirit of prophecy, and constant prayer is vital to our leadership in accomplishing God's vision for his church in these last days of Earth's history. Mission to the cities is before you. Evangelize this world through the Holy Spirit's power before it's too late. Take the challenge and run with it. God will bless our evangelistic outreach. Use everyone, women, men, young adults, including children, in reaching out to the people of the great cities. Linda Coe, our General Conference Director of Children's Ministries, will tell us what children are doing for mission to the cities. Yes, children need the gospel. According to Ellen G. White, and research shows that children are most susceptible, and we want to share the gospel with them. How do we reach children in the cities, the hundreds and the millions around the whole world church? Let's take a look at some of the programs that we've been trying to target children in the cities. One of the most effective is Vacation Bible School, or Character Building School in some places we call them. Health Expos, Sports Day event, music festivals, messy church, and Passion Week. You know, it is wonderful. I always feel so, it's heartwarming when I see a little child and all the children who come up to tell me, I want to make Jesus my forever friend. And, and we praise God for that because they are touched. Recently, in Inter-American Division, you know, in the Dominican Republic, they have for eight months worked with children sharing the gospel, teaching the fundamental belief, reaching out to kids there through Vacation Bible School, and, and notice on August 26, which Elder uh, Leto can testify to that, he was right there, and they just baptized 3,827 children and adolescents. And I say, praise God, because they have accepted Jesus. And so we try to reach them in different uh, ways. We use children's camp, refugee children ministry is one of our latest. And we're trying to set up preschools, kindergarten, literacy classes. We, the one I visited in Cambodia, and we're seeing many of them being uh, shared the gospel. Health Expo, health is the entering wedge of many of the ministries that we do. And so many children come. They are ch even the Muslim children come to our programs with the Health Expo. And, and in uh, Albania and uh, especially Croatia, we find the music camps seem to reach out many of those non-Adventists who want to come and learn about music. But through music, they learn about the God who created the music for them. And so as we look at the different resources we produce, many of them are the health ones that we hope to reach them. And we hope that we are able through the Vacation Bible School to be able to reach our children. So. Brothers and sisters, Alan G. White tells us in Evangelism 579, in the children who were brought in contact with Jesus, he saw men and women who should be heirs of the grace and subjects of his kingdom. He knows that these children will listen to him and accept him as their redeemer far more readily than would the grown-up people. And so in his teaching, he came down to the level. Yes, May we not forget to evangelize children. Aims, aims th lower, things smaller. Thank you, Linda. 
Comprehensive health ministry is absolutely vital as pastors and Adventist health professionals work together in a blended ministry as outlined by the Spirit of Prophecy. Denominational entities and supporting ministries are to closely cooperate in soul winning. Dr. Peter Landless, our General Conference Health Ministries Director, will tell us how comprehensive health ministry or medical missionary work, as it's indicated in the spirit of prophecy, is reaching the cities of the world. Peter? Thank you, Elder Wilson. The texts were chosen independently, but were conducted and uh, brought together providentially. Jesus preached, taught, and healed. He was motivated by love. He was stirred by compassion. And so he went modeling comprehensive health ministry, which is really meeting people's needs in a practical way by demonstrating God's love and compassion. And that's where our marching orders have come as a church from our fledgling days, that every member should be a medical missionary, a comprehensive health ministry worker, trained and working everywhere, but especially in the cities. How is this done? Mega expos, up to 34,000 people. Smaller expos, right throughout the world, which are being conducted right now in the 1040 window with increasing alacrity, but also increasing success. Tobacco cessation and addiction recovery, so people's minds can understand the call of God's spirit. Fun walks and runs, which will be an intrinsic part of the Japanese Union Conference outreach. And this is being a uh, being received with great joy in that area. Cooking schools so people can learn to eat better. Hospitals. We have the privilege of rendering, and this is a conservative estimate, more than $600 million of charity health care. Charity around the world each year. Nursing and medical schools, training people to go out and be Christian medical missionaries in our cities. And then, of course, about 50 million health books, which have been circulated around the globe and continue to be a part of a mission to the cities. So how do we do this? Because it's too great a work for us to do alone. We best believe this message, because if we don't believe the message, we will not live the message. We have to live the message so that we can teach the message. And so there have to be resources so that people can be trained. And there are many of those available. And once we teach the message, we can share the message. And so we will meet people's needs in a practical way, demonstrating God's love and compassion. From the heart transplant being done in our flagship hospitals in Loma Linda and Florida and wherever they are being done, to the simple loaf of bread, in which there may be more religion than there are in many sermons. Thank you, Peter. Um, let me urge you to do what Peter said. Live the health message. I make a special appeal to you. The health message is not some fanatical belief. Balanced health message is your future life, your present life. Let's continue also our large emphasis on publishing ministries with thousands of church members distributing Christian literature like The Great Controversy, Christ's Object Lessons, Desire of Ages, Steps to Christ, which is the 125th anniversary this year of Steps to Christ, the Ministry of Healing, and so many extraordinary Spirit of Prophecy and other outreach books and materials. Let's support Publishing Ministries' Missionary Book of the Year and the wide distribution, widely promoting the Spirit of Prophecy and reading programs for church members, like Growing Together, sponsored by the White Estate and the General Conference's Spirit of Prophecy Committee. 
Our prophetic message is core to all that we do in mission to the cities. The Seventh-day Adventist historicist understanding of prophecy and our historical biblical approach to hermeneutical interpretation gives us the full picture of what we believe. Do not succumb to the aberrations of hermeneutical approaches being promoted by some. Do not fall for the false approach that we really are not much different than other denominations, so let's unite with them. Maintain strong religious liberty and freedom of conscience initiatives. Do not accept the bland neutralization of Seventh-day Adventist beliefs by individuals who say, well, you only have to believe in Jesus and not doctrine. My friends, Christ is at the center of every Seventh-day Adventist doctrine. <laughs> Doctrines are not some legalistic remnant of, remnants of days gone by. Doctrines are Christ's life and teachings in practical understanding. Jesus is the center of all that we believe and all that we do in his name. He is the one who accomplishes every good thing in any of us. We are saved by grace and faith in the one who is our all in all. During this 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, reflecting on what took place 500 years ago on October 31, 1517, in Wittenberg, Germany, with Martin Luther nailing those 95 theses to the castle church doors, let us continue to champion all the fundamentals of Protestantism. Sola Scriptura, only the Bible. Sola Fide, only by faith. Sola gratia, only by grace. Solus Christus, Christ is our only mediator. Soli Deo Gloria, glory to God alone. Amen. When so many today are making an apology for the Protestant Reformation or saying it's over, let us raise the biblical banner high and realize that Seventh-day Adventists may be the last major widespread denomination to remain strongly standing for heaven's initiative of the Protestant Reformation. Our biblical beliefs matter. They are all centered in Christ, our righteousness, our creator, our redeemer, our Lord, our savior, our coming king and our best friend. Let First John Chapter 2, verses 24 to 29, fill you with hope and encouragement in the marvelous Seventh-day Adventist message to be proclaimed to the cities and the rural areas of the world. And that text tells us, therefore, let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. Amen. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. By the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. We need everyone working together under Christ's longing desire of unity found in John chapter 17. The Holy Spirit will guide every step of the way as we focus on a comprehensive and sustained evangelistic outreach for mission to the cities that will be patterned after the urban evangelistic work being done in the city of San Francisco in the latter part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. Ellen White explained this beehive of activity in the Review and Herald of July 5, 1906. And she said, during the past few years, the beehive in San Francisco has been indeed a busy one. 
Many lines of Christian effort have been carried forward by our brethren and sisters there. These included visiting the sick and destitute, in finding homes for orphans and work for the unemployed, nursing the sick and teaching the truth from house to house, distributing literature and conducting classes on healthful living and the care of the sick. A school for the children has been conducted. For a time, a working men's home and medical mission was maintained. There were treatment rooms operated as a branch of the St. Helena Sanitarium. In the same locality was a health food store. Nearer the center of the city was conducted a vegetarian cafe, which was open six days in the week and entirely closed on the Sabbath. Along the waterfront, ship mission work was carried on. At various times, our ministers conducted meetings in large halls in the city. Thus, the warning message was given by many. Please take the mission to the city's challenge seriously and submit it to God in prayer for the planning in every city in your division or around the world. I don't believe that when we get to heaven, we're only going to hear from Christ that we could have accomplished much more for the people of the cities, but we didn't take his beehive instructions in the spirit of prophecy seriously. Robert Costa, Associate Secretary in the GC Ministerial Association, is providing evangelistic outreach to cities around the world. Robert, tell us how God is blessing in evangelistic preaching on Sabbath mornings and in direct mission to the city's evangelism. Thank you, Pastor Wilson. There are two facts. Every year we spend millions of dollars to bring people to the doors of our churches. But the other fact is, Every year, we have millions of people attending our churches, many visitors. Why not to use our pulpit on Sabbath morning to preach them the whole truth? In other words, why, why not to use our own pulpits to do evangelism most of the Sabbaths? I tried, someone gave me that counsel. I tried for three months. I told the member, bring visitors because these are the subject for this quarter. They brought many visitors. I was so enthusiastic. I continued for six months. I continued for a year. And the church began to grow. I continued with, for 22 years. And I discovered very early in my ministry that this is the most effective way to do evangelists from our own pulpits and the less expensive way. Treasures were my best friends and never asked for money because the power is in the book. I challenge several people in some divisions, unions, conferences, churches, in India, England, some parts of Europe, the three Americas, and they are doing that with remarkable success. Visitors are coming, they are making appeals, and people are being baptized, and the church are growing. Let me tell you, can you imagine instead of having or expecting just one evangelist to come every a few years to the local church. If every pastor, every elder take most of the Sabbath to do evangelists from their own pulpit, something's going to happen. Something is going on. Let me tell you that the ministerial association prepare brand new sermons. Visit gcevangelist.com or the ministerial association website, and you have plenty, uh, plenty of brand new material, state-of-the-art graphics. And then uh, the, the subject we are presenting, pulpits of hope. That's the concept. We are trying to uh, tell the world that everyone, my dream, Pastor Wilson, is every elder and pastor to become an evangelist. Let's not repeat the, the story of Jonah. That's a, that's a disobedience. That's an act of rebellion against God who said, go and preach the whole message. And above all, that's a pastoral malpractice. Let's preach the word. Amen. But now back to Jonah and his own mission to the city's experience in Nineveh. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 4, it indicates that Jonah proclaimed the Lord's warning that in 40 days the city would be overthrown, and that evangelistic message was effective, producing belief in God and humility on the part of the population. In fact, verse 6 
tells us that the king himself took off his royal robe and wore sackcloth as he sat in ashes, showing his remorse and plea to God for mercy. The Nineveh mission to the city's evangelistic effort was completely successful through God's power. Amen. Verse 10 indicates, Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them. I want to tell you our efforts to bring people in the great cities to the foot of the cross can prove successful, so renew your commitment to mission to the cities. However, don't fall into the self-centered trap that caught Jonah. Chapter 4, verse 1 indicates that God's salvation displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Prophets and Kings, page 271, says, Jonah should have been the first to rejoice because of God's amazing grace. But instead, he allowed his mind to dwell upon the possibility of being regarded as a false prophet. Jealous of his reputation, he lost sight of the infinitely greater value of the souls in that wretched city. How often do we only focus on our own independent thinking and personal opinions rather than looking at the larger picture and realizing as we humble ourselves that God can work through us to glorify his name? God provided more lessons for Jonah and for us. God caused a plant to grow overnight, as you know, giving shade to Jonah, but then destroyed or allowed a worm to destroy it. Jonah 4, chapter 8, explains that the sun beat on Jonah's head and he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself. God spoke in verses 10 and 11. You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons? God taught us a specific lesson of showing concern for the people of cities before it is too late. Prophets and Kings, page 274, says, The lesson for God's messengers today, when the cities of the nations are as verily in need of a knowledge of the attributes and purposes of the true God as were the Ninevites of old, Christ's ambassadors are to point men to the nobler world. Page 276 tells us that the Lord bears long with men and with cities, mercifully giving warnings to save them from divine wrath. But a time will come when pleadings for mercy will no longer be heard. A little further on, the conditions prevailing in society and especially in the great cities of the nations proclaim in thunder tones that the hour of God's judgment is come and that the end of all things earthly is at hand. We are standing on the threshold of the crisis of the ages. It's within this environment that Doug Venn, Adventist Mission Coordinator for Urban Outreach, it's in this environment that he works. Doug has a great burden for the cities of the world. In fact, he has produced a mission video series entitled, I Want This City. Doug, we, we need a new, young, worldwide group of lay people, young adults and pastor evangelists who will proclaim God's prophetic message in evangelistic outreach and mission to the cities. Evangelism in the cities of the world is alive. Total member involvement is alive. Doug, challenge us all of us, especially young people, to engage in mission to the cities and total member involvement as we're revived and reformed through the Lord's power. And I know you will receive extra heavenly power to do that today because it's your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Wilson. I have uh, been moved and challenged, and I accept uh, the challenge to be reconverted for mission to the cities, for Christ's mission to the cities, Pastor Wilson. And as the spirit of prophecy said that too bad there wasn't a baptistry here today, I would be first to be rebaptized for his mission to the cities. And I don't know, we should do a call here today for these leaders here. How many of you would also join me in being rebaptized for this mission to the cities to have our hearts converted? converted 
for his compassion for those who are lost and those who do not know their right hand from the left. How many in this house would you join me in reconverting and rededication, rebaptism, as it were, for Christ's mission to the cities? Thank you for raising your hand. But today, as Pastor Wilson has said, the challenge and the appeal is not for you. It is for the young people who you represent, who are in our schools, our elementary schools, our secondary or academies, our colleges and universities, for you young people and that are represented in your territories. At the age of 19, I answered the call as a Walla Walla student there, and I went to Micronesia to give my heart, and I joined Pastor Rick McEdward. We were young at that time. And, but that call comes to us again today. Still pretty young. <laughs> Praise God. We have the same barber, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. In Thai, in Thai, it, there's a uh, there's a Thai saying that I learned uh, when I worked with Pastor Sam and Pastor Somchai that we have a million dollar head. It's also uh, it means that we're both bald. So, anyway. <laughs> The call today is the call to Nineveh, Pastor Wilson, for our young people, and that's the call for a changed heart, a call to care for others and not for ourselves. It's a call then for mission, and that is that call, just like the Ninevites, we're a different culture and a different uh, religion and worldview. That call comes to us to reach the Jews, to reach the Buddhists, the Hindus, and Muslims, because we are a movement of Bible prophecy, and with that, from that platform, we have something to say about Christ and preparing this planet for his soon return. We also have the call for joy, a joy of creativity and service, and we need to serve like Christ did in holistic, ongoing ways. We need to unleash the creativity of our young people as they're guided and mentored in our church planting and in this mission to the cities. I think of so many uh, examples from around the world. When I was in Japan, I learned from these young people, could we harness the dog parks of Tokyo to be places where we could minister to those those pet owners in, in Tokyo. I think of uh, Gauteng uh, 2018, next year in Johannesburg and, when, and Pretoria, that, and how we can unleash the young people there to serve in, their, in that city, as well as then I, uh, in TED, they had young people doing a street art of a, using 100,000 nails of Jesus to bring conversations in that secular city there in TED. I also see what's going on in here in NAD in one of the cities that I've served for many years in Spokane, Washington. There we see one of my pastor or one of my physicians who I mentored as a church planter, he is stepping away from his medical practice, Dr. John Turquato, in, the, in working with young medical students for two years. For what purpose? For making disciples in the city through church planting. Again, we see total member involvement of our young people sacrificing their lives and using their creative service for bringing Christ to the cities. We also see here for our young people and young adults is a call to engage in the mission of Christ, a call to sacrifice. And what does that mean? We would like to see every school doing something for Jesus, something for their cities that surround them. And I saw, I was just at in, uh, Unaspi down in, uh, near Sao Paulo, and there I got to talk with the uh, college president, Pastor Wilson, and there I learned that 30 it's their students from that university are doing 30 different creative ways to that are sustainable in their those five cities that surround that beautiful campus from skateboarders they're actually ministering to them to actually are the staff and uh, and faculty are helping to supervise the student led drug rehabilitation clinics so that was just so thrilling to see that engagement and sacrifice of our young people for admission to the cities for total member involvement so I appeal to the young people to engage in the ways that we have. Maybe God is calling you to raise something up, but we as an Adventist family have our Adventist volunteer services. One year in mission, ten, our 1,000 missionary movement, His Hands, K, uh, Project Caleb, as well as our supporting ministries who are helping us if we can align them for following Christ's method alone of f answering that call. 
Because right now, if we can listen and have our hearts converted, Pastor Wilson, right now, and we can see how Christ is calling, should I not have concern, pity, compassion for those in the great city who do not know their right hand for their left? And so that is my appeal to our young people today, that we can engage in Christ's mission to the city. Well, you heard this appeal. My fellow leaders, the time to work the cities is now. You've understood the challenge. What is your decision? For years, we've had heaven's instructions from the spirit of prophecy regarding mission to the cities. Are we listening and pleading in prayer for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in accomplishing these instructions? God's directives are plain. From that marvelous compilation, Medical Ministry, listen to some of the most poignant pleas regarding working in the cities. The Lord is speaking to his people at this time, saying, gain an entrance into the cities and proclaim the truth in simplicity and in faith. We shall gain much instruction for our work from a study of Christ's methods of labor and his manner of meeting the people. The great teacher laid plans for his work. Study these plans. Now is the opportune time to work the cities, for we must reach the people there. As a people, we have been in danger of centering too many important interests in one place. This is not good judgment nor wisdom. An interest is now to be created in the principal cities. Many small centers must be established rather than a few large centers. Let missionaries be laboring two and two in different parts of all our large cities. The workers in each city should frequently meet together for counsel and prayer. Let me emphasize the prayer part. Thank you for what Janet Page and so many are doing in emphasizing prayer. Continuing, the message that I am bidden to bear to our people at this time is work the cities without delay, for time is short. In every large city, there should be cores of organized, well-disciplined workers. Not merely one or two, but scores should be set to work. More attention should be given to the training and educating missionaries with a special reference to the work in the cities. In this work, physicians and gospel ministers are needed. We must press our petitions to the Lord and do our best pressing forward with all the energy possible to make an opening in the large cities. This is no time to colonize. From city to city, the work is to be carried quickly. Can we now depend upon our men in positions of responsibility to act humbly and nobly their part? Let no one continue to be indifferent to the situation. For years, the work in the cities has been presented before me and has been urged upon our people. In every large city, there should have been a strong force of workers laboring earnestly to warn people. Where are the men? who will work and study and agonize in prayer, as did Christ. We are not to confine our efforts to a few places. In every city, there should be a city mission that would be a training school for workers. My friends, in closing, God is calling all of us to humble ourselves before him and each other, to put away our differences of opinion to unite in God's great effort to reach the large cities of this world and the rural areas with the last message of warning and hope, the three angels' messages, culminating with the loud cry, focusing on Christ and his righteousness. The Lord is calling for a united witness with humble hearts and a willing spirit to focus on mission to the cities. The marvelous Spirit of Prophecy compilation Last Day Events has excellent instruction for us regarding the time in which we are living, the time just before Christ's return. I encourage you to read this wonderful book. It's one of my favorite compilations, Last Day Events. In fact, for those of you who haven't discovered it yet, we have a copy of this wonderful book for every one of you. Reach down beside your seat and you will find your copy. Those of you who speak Spanish, you can take the English book and trade it in the back after the service for a Spanish one. I encourage you to read all parts of the book, including chapter 4, God's Last Day Church. Now I ask you to turn to page 208. 
page 208, entitled The Loud Cry. Page 208 indicates that during the loud cry, the church, aided by the providential interpositions of her exalted Lord, page 208, will diffuse the knowledge of salvation so abundantly that light will be communicated to every city and town. A crisis is right upon us. We must now, by the Holy Spirit's power, proclaim the great truths for these last days. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, reminds us that we will be perfectly united in the Lord's message to the end of time. Paul entreats each of us in the Seventh-day Adventist Church today, at this time just before Christ's return, to humble ourselves in a contrite and committed attitude, preferring others and his church, rather than uplifting ourselves and our own personal convictions. Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Are you willing today to be bonded in the peace of the Spirit? Are you willing to exhibit lowliness, gentleness, and long-suffering, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit? Are you willing to accept the call of one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Father who will guide us in mission to the cities as we look forward to Christ's soon second coming? If so, would you quietly stand to your feet in full commitment to our Lord and our coming King? I ask you to turn to the person next to you and each of you pray a very short prayer of commitment for your endeavor to be part of Mission to the Cities and reaching every place on the planet through the power of the Holy Spirit so that Jesus can come. I invite you to pray short prayers. I will close. And I ask you to remain standing as we listen to the Colburns play, We Have This Hope, through one time. And then we will sing it together as our benediction. Please turn to the person next to you and pray.
we thank you for the privilege of being part of this great Advent movement. We realize we're coming to the very end of time. Everything around us seems to be crumbling, and we realize the only safe place is to be in the hands of Jesus. Bless now as we unitedly move forward in reaching the millions of people in the cities and, yes, in the rural areas with the saving message of Christ and His righteousness, the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, and the knowledge that Christ has made a way of escape for each of us as we minister to people in practical methods. Now, Lord, accept our commitment to you. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen.